Hi, I'm Kevin Jeter, along with Ashley Benoff, Vincent Charles, and Chris Jerry, and we welcome you to this week's edition of the Nation's Capital Sports Show, where it's most definitely on. So let's talk about what we enjoy talking about the best and the most, gentlemen, and that is sports. To start off talking about those Washington Redskins, Captain Kirk Cousins led the Enterprise Redskins ship to a victory, 38-21 to over those Cleveland Browns. There you go. All right. <laughs> All right. What a game. At first, it was a rocky start for Kirk Cousins, but he finally got it together, and uh, he came, he saw, and he conquered as he filled in for the injured Robert Griffin III. Chris. Very impressive for the young man. I think he made himself a lot of money. You know, even uh, though he's a rookie just like RG3, I think you'll find in the offseason a lot of teams may offer draft picks for him. I agree. I think that this was the first job interview and probably maybe two or three more to come after that somewhere down the road. And he may be sent, dealt somewhere else before his contract is up or Kyle Shanahan. There's lots of talk of him possibly being a head coach down the road. He may want to take Kirk Cousins with him. He never know, Vincent. He showed great poise in that game, great command of the offense, and it's good to know that you have a backup quarterback that can lead your team to victory. Now, not so fast about this talk about him going somewhere else. <laughs> Let's just stick with our good backup quarterback. That's right, and right now that's making Mike Shanahan look like a genius because he traded away the farm to bring in that Michigan State man and Kirk Cousins. Yeah, Kirk Cousins was a fourth-round draft pick out of Michigan State. He was a, a four-year starter there at Michigan State. So he has a lot of experience. He has dealt with a lot of different formations, seeing so many different defenses that he could adapt to the NFL because they did play a pro-style offense at Michigan State for a while. And when you looked at last night's game against the Cleveland Browns, you noticed that there was a different type of offensive set that was actually called for him as opposed to Robert Griffin III. You got a little bit of razzle-dazzle, but uh, Kyle Shanahan stood uh, basically to the script. Yeah, true. It was more elementary, back to the way it was when you had a Rex Grossman. But the difference was Kirk Cousins can handle that kind of style of a play. There's no read option. There was no pistol formation out of the shotgun. None of those things happened. There were a couple, you, you might find during that game bits and pieces of those kinds of plays, but basically it was an elementary style offense, which Kirk Cousins was able to handle, and he did it beautifully. That's right, and it kind of proved a little bit different for Alfred Morris because, because of there was no read options. He kind of had to actually had to earn every yard that he uh, uh, got. Yeah, you know, I thought the Redskins offense with the rollouts, again, that, I thought that was really impressive that he was able to roll out, get some of the stuff going. Like you said, he had gotten off to a shaky start, but he looked a lot better, and the thing that, that just amazes me is that the difference that Pierre Garçon as their wide receiver in that offense makes. It, it makes all the difference. That's right. He certainly does, Chris. Alfred Morris, he got his 87 yards. But I think a point to be made is how the coaches really adapted the offense to Cousins. And they show that they can take a player, work on his strengths, personnel skills, and make it work. And you have to see, really, when you think about this team this year in 2012, who Shanahan drafted and got through free agency, Richard Crawford, Pierre Garçon, RG3, those guys are the big Kirk Cousins, the big contributors of this team this year. It's who he went after this year based on the philosophy that he wanted to show on the field. Also, let's talk about another trait that Shanahan is known for, Alfred Morris, hungry, you know, actually none, actually he wasn't not known to, uh, little known in the NFL circles, but he really has proven his worth. Let's look at the numbers for Kirk Cousin. 26 of 37, 329 yards, two TDs, one pick, and of course he got sacked twice, but he made up more, uh, made that up uh, with his, you know, with great performance. He did, and, um, but let's not go too far. Now here comes my <laughs> risk and negativity. It was against the Cleveland Browns, who, you know, they really looked yep. like an inept And we should yesterday. say the red-hot Cleveland Browns <laughs> had won three games straight up to that point, but they also won against that those fledging joggernauts of the Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> right. I'm being facetious here. Yeah. They, you know, they blinked them up. But nonetheless, uh, you got to like what you saw. I mean, everyone came to play. Everyone contributed defensively. I mean, you talk in terms of London Fletcher with that one pick. I mean, you got to like that. And offensively, we talk about Logan Por Paulson, Alfred uh, uh, Morris and Leonard Hankerson. I mean, just to cast a cast of crew members for the Washington Redskins that came, saw, and conquered and were able to contribute. you got to like the way in which the defense, Ashton, is playing you know, of, of late. Sure, Kevin. And the other point I want to make here, too, is that these guys played against these pesky Cleveland Browns, but 
they didn't come and play at their level. They actually played better than them on the field, offensively, defensively, and even on the special teams. They came and played a team that is lower, that, that is not as good as them, and mm -hmm. played better than them, which in the past you haven't seen. Defensively, they held the Browns to like 220 some passing yards, which to me was astonishing. That's right. And the Washington Redskins at 8 and 6 are currently at top of the NFC East. They control their own destiny. And it also helped them out that Atlanta was able to crush the New York Giants last night, 34 to nothing. Wow, you talk about a goose egg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they crushed them. Atlanta beat them easily. And, of course, Dallas almost lost, but they did beat Pittsburgh in overtime. So now there's a three-way tie for first, but the Redskins have the tiebreakers in that right now. So if they win out, they're in the playoffs. Vincent. Speaking of the defense, they're making big plays, as the whole team is. More guys are contributing, especially these younger guys. Don't forget Kai For Forbath. He's kicking great. Ever since they got Forbath, I think it's made a difference. You have Forbath, you have um, Garcon coming back, and a lot of young guys starting to contribute. Don't forget Lorenzo Alexander. Great on special teams. He did have an injury. I'm not so sure is he going to be playing or not. Oh, I think he'll be back for the, for the Philly game. There's no doubt about it. He came back in that game. He had a pinched nerve on his right arm, but he certainly came back in the Cleveland and game. What and about I think we'll see him. What about Hankerson? Two touchdowns. That's right. Doing a good. And how about that? Yeah, Hankerson was doing well, and Cousins found him, and he found Garcon, and he found Santana Moss a couple of times. And Cousins, one thing you have to give him credit for is he was able to check down his receivers, and he found four, five, six, seven guys uh, that he passed to. So a lot of people were in the passing game. For Kirk, for Kirk Cousins. And it looks like a good decision to actually bench Robert Griffin III it actually worked out. And now what's up in the air as to whether or not he's going to be part of that Philly game. And so the question begs to be asked, do you think Robert Griffin III will start for Philly? I think that Mike Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan, and their whole team of physicians, when they have James Andrews in there, the reputed uh, uh, surgeon, if he says no again like he did this first week, then I don't think he's going to play. But I think they're going to let it be based on what the team of physicians say. I can't uh, disagree with that. Uh, personally, I, I still believe that RG3's injury is still a lot more serious than they let on. I think they all were playing possum. I don't think it was any way he's going to play. And I'm not sure that they would even put him back in the Philadelphia game. And especially... Given the way Cousins played, why do it? And you can certainly beat Philly with Kirk Cousins. That's right. right. Well, here's the thing. We're going to talk about Philly right now. You know, we're talking about Philly. They're 4 and whatever they are. 4 and 10. That's right. They're 4 and 10. They're not going anywhere. But you guys know, as well as I do, on any given Sunday, any NFL team, any NFL team can be dangerous. And actually, they can be uh, the spoilers for the Washington Redskins aspiring a playoff hopes. Well, it's so true, Kevin. I mean, this is why I think we all like the NFL. It's, it's amazing as I sit here and listen to Afshin and Vincent, and they're talking about <laughs> Hankerson doing really well and Kyle Shanahan calling these plays and the great defense, because five weeks ago, we wanted the defense out. Hankerson was a bum. Kyle Shanahan and his daddy <laughs> should be out on the That's next true. train out of the city. I mean, that just shows you how the NFL is, and all of a sudden you go from three and six and terrible, and maybe a coaching change of five wins, top of the NFC East, and it could break out this weekend that if Dallas loses, if uh, if the um, Giants lose, and the Redskins win, it's they over. could bench everybody in that final <laughs> Dallas Redskins game because the division would be won. That's right, and you got to look at the NFC East on a whole. We talked about this at the start of the season right here on AIM, which you can look at us on Comcast 69 and Files 38. And so we talked about the Redskins season in terms of we didn't think they were probably would get to the point now. We actually thought some of us around this table 8-8, eight and eight, some of us 6-10, uh, and ten, some of us uh, not even perhaps making it to the playoffs. But you made an important point at the start of the season when we start talking about the Redskins in terms of the NFC East. It's a very weak type of division. And we start talking about those New York Giants because – they haven't lived up to any expectations that they had this year. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, just as I extolled the, the Redskins' virtues of winning five in a row. Now, five weeks ago, everybody thought it was a foregone conclusion. The Giants would get one of the top two seeds. They would walk away with the East. As we speak right now, they're in the seventh position. They wouldn't even be in the playoffs today. That's how the league just kind of flips around that quickly. That's what makes the NFL so much more important than any other sport 
in, prof in American professional sports is that literally every week, every game means something. That's right, on any given and, Sunday. Right. You can lose 10 in a row in the NBA, not that the Wizards would ever come back from that, but you can still you still have a shot at the playoffs. Same thing in hockey, same thing in baseball. You gotta love the NFL. Let's talk in terms of the next two games because as you know, this is our last show of the year for 2012 here on AIM. But you can also catch us on the award-winning radio network called Stitcher.com. Just check out the nation's capital sports show. Philly, let's talk about the strengths of Philly <laughs> and weaknesses. If they have and, and so how do we think that the Washington Redskins will fare against them? And anyone can answer this question. Ferris, Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. I, I think that um, Philadelphia is going to be tougher because I think this is the last home game for Andy Reid. I think Andy Reid is going to be let go after this game or after the season. So I think Philadelphia will come out. They now are spoilers. They're four and ten. They're not going anywhere, but they actually absolutely are going to be uh, hoping to spoil the Redskins season. So I expect Philadelphia to play well. Vincent, I'm looking for a tough game from Philadelphia. Like you said, playing the spoiler role. They're at home, and they want to win. They need a win, and uh, the Redskins need to play everybody injured. You know, slightly injured. Everybody's got to suit up for this one. Yeah, she. Yeah, I think I agree with both of you guys. And if Philadelphia does have a strong point, his name is Nick Foles, the quarterback that they have. And it's not just Andy Reid's last game, but it's also a division game, or Andy Reid's last game in our opinion. It's a division game. And any time you put two division opponents together, throw the records out, as they like to say. Throw them out the window because anything can happen. And Philadelphia is looking to play the biggest spoiler uh, against the Redskins. I feel the same way that you gentlemen feel. But uh, I think North Turner out in San Diego is keeping that seat warm for Andy <laughs> Reid. You never know. Quite possible. So let's talk about the score for the Philly game. We're going to talk about the score, give your prediction, and then we're going to jump on over to Dallas. So first we'll start with you, F.C. I think the Redskins will win this one, and it'll be closer than maybe some people outside of this room think, and I think it'll be Washington 31, Philadelphia 24. Wow, such lofty expectations for Philly when they were like – dumped and bumped and bamboozled you know, in Cleveland. Vincent? Washington is scoring a lot of points. I think that's still going to be the case. Philadelphia, they're in such disarray. Redskins 31, Philly 10. Wow, that came out of your mm. mouth just like butter. Chris? I'm going to say, I'm going to go a different from both of you guys. Last time I predicted the Redskins would beat Dallas on Thanksgiving Day and I was right. I think the Eagles and what I think is going to be Andy Reid's last game, the Eagles will win, and I like 24 to 20. Wow, so they're going to give them a parting gift with a win. <laughs> yeah. Oh, mon frere. I think that the uh, Redskins are going to win this one. It's going to be a high-scoring affair, but at the hands of the Washington Redskins, Redskins 35, Philly 14. And just a reminder, my friend, I think everybody at this table predicted that the Redskins were going to beat Dallas on Thanksgiving Day, so I don't know what your is point right? is. Oh, yes. right. <laughs> but I, Except I, Vincent. Just, yeah, I think yeah, Vincent, so that's the yes, three of us. He was okay. the culprit in that one. So let's uh, fast forward over to Dallas. Let's talk about their strengths, and then we're going to talk about their weaknesses, and we're going to talk about how you think they're going to fare against the Washington Redskins. And by the way, this will be the last game of the regular season, and basically... Uh, Let's get your prediction first, Ashley. Actually, let's talk about uh, the strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, one of the biggest strengths that Dallas has is on defense, and his name is Demarcus Ware. Now, the question is, as Chris alluded to earlier, is this game going to mean anything? That's the question. So we're going to assume that it means something. And if it does, then that means Robert Griffin III is going to play, and Alfred Morris will probably run all over the Dallas defense and run away from Demarcus Ware. And I think that that as much pressure as Ware can put on RG3 or Kirk Cousins, I think that the Redskins will go ahead and win that game. And we'll call it 24 to 16. All right, we weren't asking for your prediction, but that's I good I thought enough. we were, too. I'm All sorry. Right, so, but that's good. So right. you can go next and give uh, your thoughts, and then actually give us your prediction. Very good, man. Thank I like you. that. Thank you're a trendsetter. I like that. <laughs> Love it. Tough defense. They just played a tough game against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and they won that game. DeMarcus Ware, of course, on defense. Great running game. Dallas, great balance, I think. Tony Romo's playing well this year. I'm going to say... Now, when you say you don't know if this game's going to mean anything, guys, it's a Dallas Redskins game. Records out the window. It's going to mean a lot. And we will appreciate your prediction. And, <laughs> my, <laughs> and my prediction is... You can see is, the wheels are turning up in his brain, yeah. and he's trying to figure out you the, know, how, what, what score he wants to go the with. The envelope, what. please. Yeah. My prediction is 
Redskins, 33, Dallas, 24. All right, he gave us that climatic ending or beginning. So go ahead, Chris. Well, I too, um, like Ashley said, I think it, a lot depends on if it's going to mean anything. If it does mean anything, Sorry, guys. I think, <laughs> I think the Cowboys are going to come in here, and they're on a roll. Because they've won several games in a row, too. And I think the Cowboys are probably going to win at 27-24. Wow. It's interesting because this game could mean a lot for both teams, where both teams, no matter what, could make the playoffs. The winner could be a, the division uh, uh, champion, and the loser could still get a wild card. So we, we've got to see what happens in the final two weeks of the season. And now that you've done it, say, so Kevin, what, are you, what is your prediction? Kevin, what is your prediction, my friend? Thank you very much. All right, so... <laughs> Actually, uh, I kind of changed my score several times. I wanted to say that the Redskins are going to win the final game, and that says Dallas is going to win. But actually, 28 Redskins and 21 for the Dallas Cowboys. And so I think that's how it's going to end uh, for the Washington Redskins. The Redskins will advance to the playoffs. Let's see. Playoffs? Uh, that's right. Are playoffs. You're you talking playoffs? playoffs? Well, coming up next, something else in which we're going to talk uh, as we go into this break. We're going to talk about Georgetown going into a league of their own with several other teams in the Big East. And, of course, you can listen to the nation's capital sports show on the award-winning Stitcher Radio Network at Stitcher.com. And better yet, you can also watch us here, our beautiful mugs, right here on <laughs> Arlington Independent Media, Comcast 69, and Files 38. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back to the Nation's Capital Sports Show, where it's most definitely on. We have Afshin Banak, Vincent Charles, and Chris Jerry, and I'm Kevin Jeter. And you can email us on tncsportshow at gmail.com if you want to hit us up. You can do that and uh, tell us uh, your sports stories or questions that you may have. Let's start off talking about the Big East, Georgetown University locally. Of course, they're going to be uh, wanting to form a league of their own, and they want to do that kind of soon. And so we're going to give a little bit of conversation in regards to that. So we have St. John's, Providence, Seton Hall, Marquette, Villanova, and DePaul. And so let's uh, start the conversation about them. Good or bad ideas? Some of us around this table think it should have happened sooner rather than later. Chris, we'll start with you. Well, I'm one of those that definitely in the uh, category, I think it should have happened about three years ago. Um, the Big East, as we knew it, as it was founded in 1979, uh, has not been for a long time, and it has not been because they've decided to chase football back in the 90s, and that football is just eating them up as a basketball conference. And I think this is the right thing for the Catholic schools that are leaving to decide to go out on their own, find like-minded schools that don't play major Division I FBS football, and I think it's a good move. That's right. When you look at this, action, it, it makes sense all the way around. Georgetown's nexus was playing college basketball. And that's how they started, as Chris alluded to, playing college basketball from 1979. And actually, they were even better before that a couple years prior. But, but the Big East Conference was one of the best conferences in the country until they started football in the 90s. And then from football in the 90s all the way up until now, I think they've had a turnover ratio rate more than like a, a customer at CVS. It's been ridiculous how many teams have gone in and out of that conference because of football. That's right. And when you come to look at it, it's just a good thing you know, to be happening here. One of the teams uh, seem to be left out, UConn? Yeah, UConn is a founding member of the Big East. Now, the, you know, when we talk about the football schools, obviously now they're a big football school. But when they started in the Big East, they were Division I AA. They didn't become an FBS school or a Division A until the early 2000s. So, uh, unfortunately for UConn, they're in a bad spot. They'd like to get in the ACC, but with the ACC's last expansion, and including Notre Dame, there's just no room for them now. The ACC doesn't want to be a 15-team uh, football conference because they like the idea that the divisions are 7-7. Seven and seven. So uh, who knows where UConn will fall. I think eventually they'll get in the ACC because I think eventually a school like Florida State will probably leave the ACC and open up a spot. Yeah, this changes the dynamics of all of sports in terms of every few years we're seeing teams forming allegiance and forming leagues of their own. Have we seen the last of this in collegiate sports? And we'll start with you, Vincent. No, I think you don't. Um, these teams, they want a piece of that big financial pie out there. And like Chris alluded to uh, off camera, you had mentioned something that maybe there was a contract already in the making. Right. Behind the scenes. Right. 
Yeah, you know, what I was telling Vincent and what we were talking about is just that, you know, when they make this move, when the seven schools leave, I just don't believe they just left. I believe they've had discussions with somebody, probably ESPN, probably NBC Sports Network, to establish a TV contract going forward. They're not supposed to leave until 2015, but I think they probably have an idea that they can have a TV contract as a new league. And you bring up a good point because if they're not leaving until 2015, they gave a 27-month notice, which means that they don't have to pay one of those wild exorbitant exit fees that other teams have to pay, such as Pitt and Syracuse. Yeah, that's right. And the good thing about this in terms of if their league is formed, the NCAA is going to do something better for them, and they're actually going to get like sort of like an automatic bid or something to that effect, Chris? Right. The NCAA, you know, they kind of seem like make rules as they go <laughs> as along. They go. <laughs> and one of the things that I found out on this was that Apparently, if seven teams from a conference leave as a group, they can start right. a new conference and get an automatic bid. There was the Mountain West Conference that was formed several years ago. They brought it off from the WAC, but they had to wait three years, and that was eight schools. Now, they didn't get an automatic bid, but apparently now the rules are such that if you are seven schools and leave together, you can get an automatic bid, and that would be important to any new league. And yep. I think these new monies are going to help some of those teams that are weaker off financially. Yeah. So it'll right. be good for everybody. And I think that they'll eventually get three, maybe as many as five more teams into the seven. I think that you can see a good 10-team conference, as many as 12, uh, in this whatever branded name you want to give it. Maybe they'll call it the Big East again. Who knows how they're going to work that out. But you can see some more teams. And they don't all have to be Catholic, and I don't think they all will be. Catholic schools. But this changes the dynamics of college, collegiate sports all the way around in terms of basketball because right now you have these schools that once were associated with some of them with strong football programs. Now they can come out instead of getting a pittance of what, what's left over from the football programs, they can actually get a lion's share of perhaps, who knows, $12 million per team. Well, they, and, they, and broadcast fees. Yeah, they can get some good broadcast fees, but you know, one of the things that the college basketball has shot themselves in the foot with is Letting the conference, uh, the NCAA tournament get so big, unlike football, it really has downplayed the regular season. And so I'm not sure what kind of ratings they would get. But the big thing about these seven schools that are in the Big East and are moving, they're in major TV markets. And that's going to really right. help them a lot in terms of moving forward as a new league. All right. So let me ask you, pose this question to you, gentlemen. We see the NCAA in terms of collegiate basketball now, how it's run. In the next 10 or 15, 20 years, do you see the NCAA as being this conglomerate where teams play on this bracket type of tier? Or could we actually be looking something like perhaps a Super League or, or the disbandment in terms of the NCAA when it comes to college basketball? I think what we're going to eventually see is four or maybe five 16-team conferences, and I think they're going to break off from the NCAA. When we talk about the NCAA in terms of college sports, we tend to think of Division I, the big scholarship. But the fact mm -hmm. is there are so many more schools that play Division III, non-scholarship, and Division II. So I think I can see a time where the uh, big schools will probably break off and just form their own league. And that's why there's all this movie, move, musical chairs now, Kevin, is that People want not to be left uh, left alone. The basketball schools may have a problem because they don't play football, but I think there'll be room for a new basketball conference like what they're talking about now to join these football conferences as they go into the, the super conference era. Right, I think so. I think that they'll break off and form their own super conferences. And I think what the NCAA tried to do this past year with actually implementing a mini playoff system was one reason that they're hoping that they can keep everyone together. But they definitely could break away from the NCAA, for, make their own playoff system, play it on the field, and actually have a national championship because you're talking about some of the biggest schools in the country that would garner the most money uh, from TV. Let's talk about the legal ramifications of this whole thing. What's in the name? Well, you have <laughs> Georgetown, you have DePaul, Villanova, all these teams forming their own league. Obviously, it's not going to be called the Big East. Surely it's not because by, you're going to have to owe somebody some money for the legal rights to that name. And we're talking about what about exiting fees for these teams? I mean, come on now. Are we going to be in court for ages? What's going to be the deal with this? We'll start with you. Well, yeah, they don't really have to pay any exit fees because they gave them a 27-month notice. So these particular seven teams that we were talking about don't have any exit fees from what we've heard. But the Big East, that's a good name in itself. The that's Big a great East. name. I mean, commercialization. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't want, I mean, I'm going to make somebody pay for that name. So what are you going to do? Well, as we stand right now, there's basically 11 teams that have voting interest in the Big East. 
And uh, nothing says Big East like Tulane and Houston and SMU <laughs> Boise State. and Boise State. You know, I, I really think that, that the name Big East will probably be something that could be bid on. And I, I, I think these schools may actually get to keep that name. That's what it was founded as a basketball, uh, Eastern basketball-based conference, and hopefully they'll be able to retain that name. But it's going to be litigated. And the most important, well, not the most important, but one of the important things I hope that they get to keep if, it's, if they are going to be called the Big East is that Big East tournament at Madison Square Garden. I'm hoping that they'll still be able to play that year in and year out before the NCAA. Tournament. Any, you guys gentlemen have any names for a newly formed league that features Georgetown, Villanova to the like? Uh, you guys, I, I mean, I haven't thought of any names that they could call this league, but, uh, you know, I mean, you guys have any names? Well, like I said, man, hey, if we're going to go all Catholic, the Cardinal Conference sounds good That's to me. good. <laughs> I, like that one. I was joking around with you guys earlier. How about the ACCEG? <laughs> the all Catholic conference except Georgetown. <laughs> all right, Vincent. You can call it the Eastern Atlantic Conference. The EAC. Well, you know, on that line, when the Big East was formed, it was formed out of a conference called the ECAC. Georgetown was in the ECAC That's South. Right. They had the ECAC Metro. So maybe you can go back to the old ECAC, Eastern Collegiate Athletic Conference. Maybe they could go back to that name. Back to where it all began. That's right. So what all these leagues are forming, you have schools that are odd men out. What's going to become of those teams? And there's a little bit of history behind UConn. They would like to be in the ACC, as we talked about earlier, but let's give everyone the abbreviated version because yesterday we <laughs> talked go. on and on for an hour, mm -hmm. but Chris, give us a little abbreviated version <clears throat> of what's going on with UConn. Well, I made the point, Kevin, that one of the problems with UConn that might be a problem is back in 2003 when the ACC expanded and they took in Virginia Tech, they took in Miami, and they took in Boston College, UConn was left out. And then uh, Attorney General, General Blumenthal of Connecticut sued the ACC. And there was a settlement. There was some money paid to the Big East, and there was also an agreement to play some schools. But I, I, I would say to you that those ACC presidents never liked the fact that Connecticut, not the school, but the, the state, sued them. And this might be their time of like getting them back. Like, okay, hey, we're not going to bring you in. In fact, mm -hmm. it was even speculated that when the ACC decided to bring in Syracuse and Pittsburgh, they brought in Pittsburgh because there were a lot of presidents who had said, no, we're not taking UConn because they sued us back in 2004. So maybe that's why they're on the outside looking in today. Ashley. I would love to see them get into the Big East uh, Conference or the new conference if they could, at least as a basketball uh, school. I don't know what they would do with their football program. They'd have to find someplace else. But I, I, I heard, I know what you're referring to, Chris, and, and the ACC is probably snubbing their noses at UConn right now. So last question in regards to this. As economic cha times change for a lot of collegiate sports here in this country, do we see a lot of teams such as Howard University uh, in those type of teams g forming allegiances with other uh, schools in terms of forming different leagues, or in not only that particular league in the MEAC, but any particular college uh, league, like smaller teams want to band together and form a league of their own? I don't think so. I think if the big schools leave the NCAA and form their own, the NCAA will probably stay around, and that will be where the Howards and those schools are. There is another organization called the NAIA, which at one time was considered a, a pretty big organization for schools and now people rarely hear of it because it's like a whole bunch of small schools so right. you know the NCAA could fall back a little bit and, and be a school where the MEACs of the world would play in. Who knows? I think the top tier schools are the ones that are going to go for the money they're going to be the ones that get the money the lower tier schools I don't see any major changes coming in the next few and years. And I agree. Yeah Actually. I agree too I mean it's it's it is all about the money when you put head to pillow and those bigger schools are going to make a lot of money down the road. That's right. As uh, Jerry Maguire would say, or Cuba Goody's junior uh, character would say, <laughs> show me, me the, the money. money. All right. So now we're going to go on to a part of the show in which we do on a podcast <clears throat> for the last three years. And we give our sports wishes for Washington teams or for national teams. And actually, I'm going to start out first. I'm going to wish uh, the Washington Wizards, uh, <laughs> if I wanted to give them a gift, it would be magic sprinkle dust. And I would sprinkle it on, you know, uh, each member of the Wizards, and they would play to fruition. They would start winning. No more injuries. And, of course, uh, they would actually finish off the season on a winning note. That's my wish for the 
Washington Wizards. <laughs> a little sprinkle dust there. A little chemistry for that's them. That's right. right. They that's need it. Right. Yeah, I would take some of that sprinkle dust and put it on the NHL players and the Players Association and the owners especially and tell them to get back on the ice. I do miss hockey. Yeah, they uh, need more than sprinkle dust. They need a yeah. lightning rod so they can get to it. It's been a whole month. Yeah, you know, it's, they, it's they, been a while. They've been going at it like uh, two dis dissatisfied, jilted uh, lovers. <laughs> I miss on frozen pond <laughs> hockey, man. I love watching some hockey, especially this time of year, and it would be nice to see them get back out on the ice, Vincent. Certainly would. Vincent. Uh, my wish for the coming year is uh, I'd like to see Santa bring a couple more bags of patience for <laughs> Ted Leonsis <laughs> because you got to admire his patience with what's going on with the NHL and the Wizards. So that's my wish. I think it should be more directed at the Wizards than anything else because I think he's been overly patient in that. And you guys know how I yeah. feel about GM, GM, or in this particular case, GM, what's his name, Ernie Grunfeld of the Wizards. And I don't think even if you got rid of him, you still have the baggage of all that inflated salary with subpar players. I mean, that's just the way I feel. Chris? Well, I'm going to kind of like piggyback on half scene. Uh, if I had a wish for anybody, it really would be for the Capitals, not so much because of the team, but just because of the fans, because they really developed a really loyal fan base. They've come out just a couple weeks ago. The minor league team of the Caps, the Hershey Bears, played the Norfolk Admirals, and they had a full house watching AHL hockey yep. because they were so starved. So it would be good to see if they could get some kind of a settlement and get back on the ice. It doesn't for look fans, likely, that's right. but that's for the fans. I like to see hockey back. And, and Vincent, you posed this question to <clears> me <throat> on our podcast, uh, 117, which you can hear on the award winner Stitcher Radio Network at stitcherradio.com. Just look at the Nation's Capital Sports Show. Not a shameless plug. But basically, we talked in terms of the Capital fans. Will this walkout, a lockout, deprive the fans? Of course it will. But will it make their resolve any more belligerent? No, because... As Chris alluded to, we have some of the most loyal fans in terms of capitals. And they're willing to wait this out. They're going to yep. be dissatisfied because of the way in which this whole thing was handled. But eventually, they're going to return in droves, and they're going to be rocking that red, so to speak. Yeah, I agree. And, and they could come back in January, who knows, and maybe possibly play a 40 to 50 game schedule. But we have some of the most loyal fans in D.C. when it comes to the Washington Capitals. It's almost like a cult following when they go out and see the Capitals. I mean, they really fill up Verizon Center. So I think they'd be back if, they, if hockey were to start tomorrow. That's right. Well, did you hear, before we actually get into more things on here, about uh, the Washington Wizards in which you can find tickets on sale at StubHub? <laughs> Relatively dirt cheap. I don't know why I thought about that, but I thought about you because you and I went searching for good seats to a, to a Wizards game. You did, did a search on your own, and I actually saw tickets that usually range for 107 bucks. You can get them for like 45 mm. or 30 bucks. Well, that was cheap, and I actually was going to treat my brother as a Christmas gift to a game because I saw like in the 400 section tickets for 99 cents, and I could get for like $13. <laughs> so the, 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 the point I was trying to make, <laughs> there, there, there's disadvantages. There are some advantages right. to when you have a, a, a losing season, so That's to speak, right. and That's it works right. out for the consumer, you know. Yeah. Who says, yeah, you right. know, who says you can't... Uh, uh, go to a good game at a reasonable course, a, a cost, especially an NBA game. Right. That's right. So we come to the end of the road for our 2012 uh, show here, Nation's Capital Sports Show here at AIM, where you can catch us on Comcast 68 and, of course, Files. I'm sorry. Comcast, Comcast 69. 69. And Files 38. That's right. That's right. And so, Afshin, you actually, um, you're going to read off some names yeah. for our great crew here. Have a great crew we have, and uh, we want to wish them all a happy holiday. Devin Gallagher, Charles Smith, Philippe Diaz, Quinn Pock, Ken Briley, Steve Cordo, Celine Distasio, Sally Gelestino, Jonathan Kim, and Marilla Pellicciari. That's right. And uh, a great crew we have, and happy holidays okay. to all of so you. They make yeah. us look and, and sound good. And throw another log on the fire, will you? That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, we got, we got a fire going in the background. All we need is some... Uh, Alcohol-free eggnog. No <laughs> mistletoes. I'm not into that with you guys. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it's been a good experience here for 2012 here at the Nation's Capital Sports Show, where it's most definitely on. And i like to say I uh, wish each of you gentlemen a very safe and pleasant holiday. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Um, Merry Christmas, if you celebrate that. And, of course, uh, Feliz Navidad. And if I, didn't, if I missed something in there, that, uh, have a happy holiday. So, on behalf of Vincent Charles, Chris Jerry, 
and Afshin Banav. I'm Kevin Jeter. We wish you the best. Happy sporting. And you're listening to the Nation's Capital Sports Show, where it's always on. Take care.